So there's multiple everyday activities that we can do to keep our brain healthy and to maintain our cognitive function for as long as possible. Sometimes these are referred to as the pillars of brain health. Uh, So if you hear that phrase, that's what they're referring to. And of those pillars of brain health, the science indicates that the most effective one is regular physical exercise. Welcome to Absolute Trust Talk with your host, Kirsten Howe. Absolute Trust Talk brings you tips, tools, advice, and interviews to help you build a reliable knowledge base on estate planning, business, and finance to start preparing for your future today. Hello, and welcome to Absolute Trust Talk. I am the host today, Kirsten Howe, and I'm glad to see you here today. I got two of my cats in the background tangling with each other, so you might hear that. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully, we can edit it out, so I apologize in advance. And yes, I did say two of my cats. I officially am a crazy cat lady. I have more than two cats. Okay, so today, we're going to be talking about retirement planning, but not the kind that you're probably thinking of, all that, you know, maxing out your 401k, diversifying your portfolio, blah, 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 boring. No. Today, we're going to be discussing the impact that our brain health has on our retirement plans and what we can do starting right now to maximize our brain health when we reach retirement age. My guest today is Dr. Quinn Kennedy, and she has a PhD in psychology and has also completed postdoctoral training in cognitive aging and all of that at Stanford. She has over 20 years of research experience in investigating factors that affect older adults' decision-making, memory, and performance. Dr. Kennedy's research has been recognized through multiple awards, grants, and peer journal publications, including Psychological Science, Psychology of Aging, and Journals of Gerontology. And with her collaborators, her work has been featured also on major media, Down to News, NPR, in the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, and Science Magazine. Dr. Kennedy is a popular speaker on healthy cognitive aging, and she just recently has launched an online webinar series, which is sort of what prompted me to reach out to her and invite her here today on how to maintain brain health and cognitive function. And also through her consulting business, she has worked with a variety of companies, including startups and financial planning service providers. Dr. Kennedy, welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. I am so delighted to be here this morning, Kirsten. Okay. Well, let's get started. Why don't we start sort of with the premise, the underlying stuff. Talk about a little bit about how our brain function typically changes as we age, you know, what you call the cognitive aging trajectory. Yeah. So starting in our 40s and 50s, we may start noticing some subtle changes in how fast our brain works and how well we retain short-term memory. And these changes tend to become more pronounced with each passing decade. So if you imagine a little graph, it kind of looks like that. However, there's a lot of variability Some people, I think we all know people who kind of stayed at the top of that, let's see, top, top of that trajectory uh, until basically they died. And then other people who sadly have very rapid decline and have Alzheimer's disease in their 60s. So there's definitely a lot of variability in that cognitive aging process. Right. So for some people, but certainly not all, that trajectory includes more serious impairment And dementia, in most cases, I think, is a rather gradual process, so it can be kind of hard to recognize maybe in the early days. And we all, at least speaking for myself, we all experience things from time to time, like forgetting where our car keys are, those kinds of little lapses in memories. What guidance can you give us for telling the difference between something that's just ordinary distraction, you know, your life is too busy, that's why you lost your car keys, or a lapse that's something we kind of need to pay attention. Yeah, so I would point you to the Alzheimer's Association website. They have a terrific section called, it's called something like Know the 10 Signs, and it walks through the 10 signs for Alzheimer's disease. And for each of those signs, it indicates, gives an example of, here's a typical age-related change 
And here's an example of when it would be cause for concern. So exactly like you said, you know, forgetting where you left your car keys in the morning, but then later remembering where you put them, that's a totally normal age-related change. Forgetting how to drive home from your local grocery store, that's a big indicator that you should probably go see your doctor. Right. Okay. So sort of not remembering how to do things that you really should know. Yes. <laughs> that's different from, oh, I... I put my car keys in my purse when I should have put them on the shelf over here kind of thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or I put my car keys in the refrigerator. That's probably a problem. <laughs> that, that, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm familiar with that one, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And what are some of the other resources you would recommend for people who are worried about their own brain function? So I would start off with looking at that section on the Alzheimer's Association, right. read through those 10 signs. And if after reading that section, you're still concerned about yourself or perhaps somebody else, what I recommend is making an appointment at a place like the Stanford VA Alzheimer's Center, where they will do a free memory evaluation for you. So in California, that's your state taxes at work. There are places like that all over the country. These Alzheimer's centers are usually affi affiliated with like university hospital. So I strongly recommend making an appointment, getting that comprehensive memory evaluation, and then proceeding from there. Yeah. That's really good to know. And, and that is free here in the Bay Area. Yes. yes. At Stanford. Yeah. Yes. So as we're going along talking, any reference that is made to resources, we will drop that into the show notes for this episode on our website, just for those of you who are wondering, where can I find that? And the other thing I want our listeners to know is Dr. Kennedy has made available just a two-page document that has a lot of these resources that we are going to be talking about and even more that we probably won't get to. But that reference there to that Stanford Testing Center is there on that page, and you'll be able to find that in the show notes for this episode when we're done, when we get it posted. All right, now, so the big question that I am sure everyone's thinking as they listen to us today is, what can we do to keep our brains as healthy as possible? What does the research show is the most effective thing we can do? Yes, yeah, so there's multiple everyday activities that we can do to keep our brain healthy and to maintain our cognitive function for as long as possible. I'm, at some point, I'll figure this out, but keep it up here rather than going down downhill. Um, and sometimes these are referred to as the pillars of brain health. Uh, so if you hear that phrase, that's what they're referring to. And of those pillars of brain health, the science indicates that the most effective one is regular physical exercise. It has this double whammy effect, protective effect for our brain. So on the one hand, it strengthens neural connectivity. It increases cerebral blood flow, which is really, really good for our brains. And on the other hand, it reduces the risk for things such as cardiovascular disease, chronic stress, poor sleep, and all of these things are risk factors for dementia. So regular physical exercise, great way to maintain your good cognitive function and help your brain health. Okay. That's number one is... Physical yes. exercise. Okay. Yes. Um, what else? What are some other things on that list? <laughs> so I'm probably going to use my fingers pillars. now. Yeah. yeah, the other pillars. So um, getting seven to nine hours of sleep on a regular basis. And for that one, it really is like a Goldilocks in the three bears situation. So getting less than seven hours on a regular basis is really, really bad for your brain and definitely increases your risk for dementia. Getting mm -hmm. more than nine hours also um, increases your risk for dementia. So you oh. really want to go for that seven to nine hours. Mm -hmm. So definitely think about Goldilocks and go for go for the middle there. That's interesting. I, I yes. never heard that before. That's really interesting. Yes. I, the, I, that's I, never my problem. I'm never getting too much sleep, I will tell you. That right. Much. Yeah, most <laughs> people know about you need more sleep, but they don't realize that you can get, you can too, get too, much, much. too much sleep. So that's one, doing cognitively engaging activities, the whole use it or lose it that I think we've all heard of with our brain. Eating a healthy diet has big implications for our brain health. Stress management techniques such as practicing mindfulness 
and uh, having strong social connections. So the nice thing is that probably all of us already do many of these things anyway, and so we're already helping out our brains. Right. Okay. Yeah. We're probably all doing some or most of them to some degree, but probably right. many of us could do better. Is my guess. Healthy diet. What does that mean in this context? Right. So what's really exciting to me is that there's been recent findings with this diet called the MIND diet, and it stands for Mediterranean DASH Diet Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. So obviously scientists came up with that name, right? But basically it's, it's based on evidence that some food groups are brain healthy and other food groups are brain unhealthy. And so the diet basically recommends that you increase the brain healthy foods and you decrease the amount of brain unhealthy foods in your diet. And why people are so excited about this diet is that they did a 10 year longitudinal study and they found that people who most adhere to this type of diet, not only do they maintain good, you know, they have a slower rate of cognitive decline uh, than people who have moderate or even poor adherence to this diet, but it's actually to the point where they're like seven and a half years younger than people who have poor adherence to the diet. So that's really, really exciting. So what you eat totally affects your brain health um, over the long term. Wow. Yeah. You yeah. are what you eat. Definitely. That is, oh, wow. I got to, <laughs> I got to go grocery shopping. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's good. It's good to know. It's good to know. And at what age should we be doing these things? So I have two answers. Can I give you two answers? Yeah, of course. You sure. can have as much as you want. <laughs> So the first one would be, you know, sooner is better than later, but any time is better than no time, right? And so the earlier, the younger you are that you start implementing these things about the regular physical exercise, the good sleep and so forth, the more impact it's going to have on your late life brain, the more it's going to help out your cognitive function during your retirement years. However, you will get benefit at any age starting these implementing these methods. So one study, for example, found that people in their 80s showed reliable improvements in memory after learning a new skill, right? And so that's part of that cognitively engaging activity. So learning a new skill, is a great way to boost your cognitive function. And again, it's going to be better if you start doing that in your 30s, 40s, 50s, but you will still get a benefit in your 70s, 80s, and 90s. My second answer would be, would be as soon as you start saving money for your retirement, this is when you should be thinking about these things. So they really, that's my goal is that these just come they embedded into your, re yeah. yeah, they totally do. They totally it's do. All, yeah. It's all a part yeah. of having a, a happy, successful retirement years. Exactly. Yeah. Which, okay. So that ties us right into the webinar series that you're starting. Can you tell us about that? Sure. So I've partnered with Peter Johnson from PW Johnson Wealth Management Services to launch this webinar series. And basically, the point is to show two things. So first, that people have more control over their cognitive aging process than many people realize. And second, maintaining good cognitive function has some very positive benefits for your retirement savings. You know better than I do, Kirsten, that the majority of older adults in our country require some type of long-term care and right. being able to stave off the need for things such as adult daycare or assisted living or expensive medications due to cognitive impairment, that means you're going to be able to spend more of your retirement savings on the things that you want to be doing right. rather than on formal caregiving services. And so we launched this webinar series basically, again, to start this process of just embedding these techniques into retirement planning. And the idea here is that people like yourselves, like financial planners such as yourself, could just automatically provide this information to your clients as this part of your regular service. So that's the intent of the webinar series. Yeah, I think that's brilliant, really, because you go to all this trouble, all this effort, you work so hard and you squirrel away money and you do all the right things. And then you turn 65, you retire. And if you've got dementia, who cares? <laughs> you know, you, you, you're yeah. not going to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Right. You're going to be using that money in a very different way. Exactly. And yes. Yeah. And paying for care is not cheap. It's 
It's very crazy expensive. expensive. Yeah. It can really destroy a retirement plan. So yeah. I think financial planners who are, you know, looking out for their client's best interest, they're all paying attention to this kind of thing these days. It's, it's really great what you're doing by educating people with these webinars. Can people view the webinars? Is that going yeah. to be available? Okay. It's available. I can share the link with you. So it's, you can find it on the web and anybody can watch them. It's not just for financial planners. It's for everybody. So of course I'd be delighted yeah. <laughs> for okay. people to, to watch it. It's about an hour's worth of videos broken into three segments. And there's also a lot of supplemental materials as well. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we will put the link to the webinar series as I said in the show notes on our website, so you can find that. And I encourage listeners to check that out because I'm sure there's a lot more that Dr. Kennedy has to share than what we can get done here on this little podcast. Okay, so we talked about the pillars, uh, how you can keep your brain healthy, diet, exercise, learning new things, but we Americans... <laughs> We like it the easy way, if there is an easy way. What about these brain-boosting supplements that we see on early morning television? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, uh, the old saying that if it seems too good to be true, it probably is, totally applies. And to my knowledge, there is no brain-boosting supplement right? That actually That's not works. a real thing. Yeah. It's not really a real thing. And I encourage people watching this again to go back to the Alzheimer's Association website because they have another section that's called alternative treatments. And if you click there, they actually walk through, oh gosh, maybe like 10 or 12 different supplements and what scientists have found in terms of whether or not they actually impact brain health and cognitive function. So I really encourage people to go to a respected site like the Alzheimer's Association rather than, you know, just cruising through CVS or, or yeah. Google. Reading the marketing materials. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> that's, that's usually not a place for reliable information. The other thing that, you know, people talk about that you read about are these brain training programs or apps that you can download and play some kind of thing every day or for 90 minutes a day, something like that. Are those kinds of exercises helpful? So yes and no. It kind of depends on what you expect to get out of them. So if you're doing one of these brain training programs because it's one of your cognitively engaging activities, yes, it's helpful. You will improve on one of the, their memory tests or memory training programs or whatever it is. If you are doing this because you're hoping it will help you remember where you put your keys, the evidence is not there. And so the example I typically give is, you know, you may improve a lot on one of these memory training games, but that that's not going to help you when you're standing in the middle of the grocery store trying to remember the items on your list that you left back home. Why did I come here? Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. So it doesn't transfer over, that improvement doesn't transfer over into everyday life. So okay. that's, so again, it depends on why you're, you're using doing the program. Again, right. if you're doing it as a cognitively stimulating activity, great, keep doing it. Otherwise, right. you could probably find something else to do. Do something else that you enjoy and find cognitively stimulating. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So those, those things are good for getting better at doing those things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good for getting better at doing the app. Right. Okay. So I, in, this is the point in the episode where I'm going to answer one of my Ask Kirsten questions. So we encourage listeners to email us questions that they would like us to answer, or I mean, they would like me to answer. And we've received a number of them and I pick one and I answer it during the show. If you have a question, it doesn't have to be about what we're talking about on the show. And in fact, it almost never is because these questions are sent ahead of time. If you have a question you think I can answer, go ahead and send it to us. It's info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. So today I have a question from uh, Jordan in Lafayette. Jordan's question, my father is in a nursing home for rehabilitation after a stroke. It doesn't look like he's going to recover enough to live at home again. Medicare has informed us that it will no longer pay for him to stay in the facility. 
So now the nursing home is telling us we have to take him home. Can they do this? Oh, okay, this is the kind of thing we see all the time. And I can't say exactly from these facts, but probably not. This is a very common problem our clients face all the time. And it's really important that people understand how this works. The, this facility accepts payments from Medicare. That's what Jordan said in her question. All facilities that accept Medicare or Medicaid, which we call Medi-Cal, have to comply with federal law. And there are very specific laws about when someone can be transferred or evicted out of a nursing home. The patients can be made to leave without their consent for only very specific reasons. And these are spelled out in the federal law. And termination of Medicare benefits is not one of those reasons. So once Medicare stops paying, you cannot be evicted as long as somebody continues paying. Either you are going to be private paying or you can go on to Medi-Cal and they will be paying. If your Medicare gets terminated and you apply for Medi-Cal, you haven't gotten Medi-Cal yet, but you've at least applied, still they can't evict you because you're in the process of applying for Medi-Cal to get Medi-Cal to pay. So it's very important to understand your rights. And if the nursing home is insisting that you leave, my suggestion is talk to an attorney and make sure that you don't leave if you don't have to. And especially that you don't leave if it's not safe for you to go home. Okay, Dr. Kennedy, back to our show. I'm just going to remind our viewers, listeners, info at absolutetrustcouncil.com if you have a question you'd like me to answer someday on the show. Let me ask you, there are medications that have been around for a while to treat dementia. Are those effective? Yeah, I mean, so I think most people are familiar with Aricept is I think the most commonly known Alzheimer's drug. And yeah, so these drugs, they do help slow down that cognitive, the rate of cognitive decline. They do help, you know, kind of slow down what, when you're going to transition to the next phase of the disease, right? So they can keep you steady for a longer period of time. The caveat with these medications is that they are most effective during the early phases of the disease. And unfortunately, most people aren't willing to acknowledge that they have a problem until they're in the moderate or sometimes even in the severe phases of the disease. So they have completely missed that window of opportunity to take advantage of those medications. So I really encourage your listeners to, I know it's a really scary, it's a really tough thing to think about, but please, please, if you're worried, go to a place like the Stanford VA Alzheimer's Center and get started on those drugs if you need to right away. That, that is such a good point. I'm, as with many scary illnesses, we can have a tendency to just kind of stick our head in the sand and hope it's not true. But no, knowledge is almost always a much better way to go. Just figure it out and then you can do something. But if you, exactly. if you stick your head in the sand, you're not going to do anything and you might miss an opportunity. Which brings us to that new drug that was recently approved by the FDA. You knew I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And there, I mean, I know I'm just a lay person. I don't, you know, what do I know? But I was aware there was a bit of controversy over the FDA's approval of that drug. What can you tell us about that? Yes, yes, there's lots of controversy. <laughs> so basically, a little bit of background. So first, this drug is different from like Aricept and stuff because it's not a pill. It's actually an infusion that you get. And it, what does that mean, an infusion? So you get an injection, right? Okay, okay. Instead of, you know, just interesting taking a pill. A pill. Yeah. yeah. So you got to go to the doctor's office to get you it. You have to go to the doctor's office. The idea is that it's going to remove one of the types of neuropathologies in the brain that can lead to Alzheimer's disease. And that type of neuropathology is called amyloid beta. Okay. So it's pretty good. The evidence is that, yeah, it does a good job of removing this amyloid beta from the brain. That's not the controversial part. The controversial part has to do with its clinical benefit. So there were two big studies. Let's see if you can see my, gosh, I'm really messing up. The, okay. So here are my two studies. These are the people. Okay. So like 1500 people in each uh -huh. and a small subset in each study got a high dose of that drug. Yeah. And one of those small subsets of people 
they showed modest clinical improvement. So out of all these people, only this little group of people showed modest clinical improvement. And for those of you who know statistics, what they mean by modest clinical improvement is that these people on average in this one little, one little group showed about a one third of a standard deviation improvement on, the, on those cognitive tests after taking the drug than as compared to before they took the drug. And my understanding is that typically the FDA requires at least a one, a full standard deviation, a full standard deviation. of improvement mm. to be considered clinically beneficial. And so you have only a small subset of people who showed a very modest clinical benefit. And so there's a lot of questions as to why the FDA approved it with that type of evidence. And then compounding that, you had the price tag. I mean, this is a really expensive drug. So the expectation is that you will get one of these infusions every year, and it's $56,000 a pop, and it's not covered by Medicare, at least not yet. Actually, there was an article yeah. that I read yesterday that it would kill Medicare to I saw cover that too. it. Yeah. yeah. And so when you have this very expensive drug with, at least at this point, uncertain clinical benefit, there's a lot of chit chat about that. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that article recently too, that they anticipate that if Medicare did have to cover this, it would, <laughs> it would be Medicare for no one, <laughs> not, yeah. not Medicare for all. Right. So yeah. And the name of the drug, I didn't say it and you didn't say it. Can we say it? So the commercial name is Aduhelm. Aduhelm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting that we all are much more familiar with the workings of the FDA than we used to be, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's kind of interesting, a little peek behind the curtain. Who knows what that was about? Lots of conjectures, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not going to ask you to commit to a, a theory on air, but we can talk about that after the mic's turned off. Uh, okay, now, so this is the time in our episode where we're going to turn to audience questions. And we have, here we go. Okay, we hear that doing crossword puzzles is a good way to keep your brain healthy and avoid dementia. Is that true? I, that's a real common, popular understanding. Right. What do you right. think? So here's the thing. For an, an activity to be cognitively engaging, you have to find it interesting. You have to find it fun. Otherwise, you won't do it. Right. And it has to be at least moderately challenging. So if you regularly whiz through crossword puzzles, say the Sunday morning, you know, crossword puzzle, doing more crossword puzzles is not going to boost your cognitive function. You need to shift over to Sudoku or maybe even the spelling bee, right? So you need to shift it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So again, if you're just starting to do crossword puzzles, if it's a new activity for you, yes, that's great. Okay. If you're already a whiz, you're not going to get as much benefit from continuing to do them. Okay. So yeah. you, can, you can continue doing it because it's fun, but don't expect that it's going to yes. do much for your brain. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like, like you say, switch to the acrostic or whatever. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. One, yeah. The one that I, uh, there's that one with the, it looks like a crossword puzzle, but it's full of puns and anagrams and stuff. I usually skip that one because it's too hard, but now I'm going to try. Okay. There's your motivation. <laughs> 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 All right. Here we go. Do we understand why dementia seems to be so much more common now than it was many years ago? Is it just because we are living longer? So partly, I mean, you know, the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and dementia age. Is, <laughs> is age. So each, you yeah. know, every five years, your risk factor goes up quite a bit. Yeah. Um, so that is part of it. And I would also say that scientists and physicians have gotten better at detecting it. Right. So there's both of those things. So it seems like it's more prevalent for both of those reasons. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Okay. Sort of related, I guess, are there countries or populations that seem to have much lower incidence of dementia than the U.S., for example? And if so, do we know why that is? That is a great question. I don't know the answer to that. That would be a good research project for somebody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they would have that information on who, you know, the World Health Organization. They actually oh, yeah. do have a section okay. about Alzheimer's disease. Oh, there. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. 
I, I wouldn't want to conjecture there. No, uh, it's yeah. fair. I understand. Uh, but I was going to say maybe those countries that just naturally stick to that healthy diet. <laughs> right. Right. We don't seem to be drawn to in America naturally. Many of us have to force ourselves to eat healthy. Uh, okay. Dr. Kennedy, thank you so much for being here. I, I really appreciate you sharing your your knowledge and your vast experience and your webinars <laughs> with us. I'm, I'm sure there are many people in the audience who are going to jump on that as soon as they can. Thank you, Kirsten. It's been a real pleasure. And I could talk for hours and hours on this, on this <laughs> topic. So thanks for keeping me yeah. to a tight schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a big topic and a half hour just doesn't do it justice, but it's what we have. And thank you all for being here. I hope you got a lot out of it. I know I did. And I look forward to connecting with you next time. Thank you for joining us today for another episode of Absolute Trust Talk Live. If you enjoyed listening in, then don't forget to subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you may listen by searching Absolute Trust Talk. While you're there, we would also love for you to leave us a review. And then why not share your favorite episodes with family, friends, or colleagues too? You can find all of our shows and corresponding show notes by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com. You'll also find a variety of other free resources, including our eBooks, videos, blogs, presentations, and more. If you need help with your estate planning or administration, we also offer a free discovery call to help get the process started. You can find more information on booking your session by visiting AbsoluteTrustCouncil.com slash scheduling. Don't forget to keep an eye out for our next live episode in two weeks. If you join us for the broadcast, you can submit questions during the show. But if not, don't worry. You can always get in touch with us by sending a quick message to info at absolutetrustcouncil.com. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you soon. This podcast is not meant to take place of legal advice from an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you do have a legal question or issue, please consult with an attorney.